is from the History Museum in Tallahassee, our state history <coughs> museum. And we're very proud to present it to you all. If you take a little time to read your panels, you'll learn a lot about Florida's history, Florida's World War II history. Um, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to say that our next Hello, everybody. My bride is here with her mom, and I warned them on the way in that you were gonna, she was going to hear some of my usual uh, Vegas entertainer opening line jokes. <laughs> so she's prepared. Um, so, uh, OK, first one. How many of you uh, are originally from up north? OK. How many of you still have family up north? OK. How many of you have been calling them the last few weeks to rub it in? <laughs> February is rub it in month, or up north it's I hate Florida month. Uh, the warm weather is not just a throwaway line that I want to get a laugh out of. It's the reason why World War II had a big role in Florida and why it helped put Florida on the map. A couple of things. First of all, um, as I always do, I should note that uh, pretty much anything that I tell you about Florida history or history in general, I learned from my dad, Howard Kleinberg, uh, who many of the folks here might know, the old editor of the Miami News, passed away in September. And uh, so, uh, you know, I can't call him up anymore to double check my facts. Uh, usually when I did, it turned out I was wrong. 
so let's talk about World War II in Florida. First of all, Mary mentioned that this is, in fact, sponsored by the Florida Humanities Council. If you have a public group, it really needs to be a public group, that would like to have, come, have me come and speak. Uh, I have several topics, but three of them are part of the Florida Humanities Council, which means that uh, they'll pay me. And all you, all you guys got to worry about is mileage, which here isn't a big deal because I live up the street. Uh, you don't have to pay for a hotel. Uh, so please support the Florida Humanities Council. I mean, look at this room. This is all Florida Humanities, you know, Florida history. Um, and the Speakers Bureau is amazing. If you don't want to bring me in, they have two dozen speakers across the board, and sure, including Sharon Koskoff, who, uh, who you, some of you might know. Uh, so please support the Humanities Council, and please consider bringing in one of their speakers. So first question, are there any military veterans here? Thank you. Thank you for your service. I was doing a talk in Marco Island about a month ago, and I said it, I asked that question, and then I said, are there any World War II veterans? And one guy in the back <laughs> raised his hand. The place went crazy. Um, I don't have to tell you that that's becoming rarer and rarer. Uh, you know, if you were... If you were 20 years old on Pearl Harbor Day, you're 40, 60, you're 100 years old now, I think. Um, I had one lady who wrote to me once, because I, I interviewed many, many World War II veterans. Uh, I was very fortunate. I interviewed World War I veterans. Yeah. So after I'd interviewed these, these really uh, veterans who were quite on in years, I'd, I, and I'd always mention that in the story that they're, you know, that age is taking what the what the Germans couldn't and that sort of thing. And a lady wrote in and she goes, why do you have to always mention in your story that these guys are old? That they're at the end of their lives? I said, well, first of all, they know. <laughs> and in fact, almost to a man, they would say, we know we're at the end of our lives and we have stories to tell and we want to tell them while we're still here. And because of that attitude is why we have millions of oral histories of this profound event. Now, at the Palm Beach Post, my editor came up to me in uh, the fall of 1941. And he said, we are entering a 50-year anniversary window of World War II. Uh, I know it started in 39 with uh, the German invasion of Poland, but really for, for American purposes, it really started with Pearl Harbor. And uh, he, said, he said, I want you to write everything local, everything, everything, everything. So I said, no, please, I don't want to, please, I beg you, uh, don't make me do it. Uh, and of course, I did dozens of stories, and they were all amazing. Because we're a local paper, and everybody knew about Pearl Harbor. But they didn't know that two guys from West Palm Beach who went to high school together were vaporized in the gunpowder room aboard the Arizona. Or that a guy from Fort Pierce was inches away uh, from uh, going into uh, a marching band on one ship, but the doctor noticed he had a bad toe and they had to get it repaired, and so he was assigned to a different ship, and the ship rolled over on Pearl Harbor morning and he was drowned. There's no disrespect to the guy from New Jersey who was at Pearl Harbor who now lives in Boca. But I wanted to talk to the guy from West Palm Beach who was at Pearl Harbor or his family because everybody was interviewing survivors. And I said, well, wait a minute. That's easy. The really people we should be talking about are the people that weren't their survivors. And so I had to go out and find the families of these people that were killed. And over the next four years, I wrote a number of stories, uh, amazing stories all across Florida. And at the end, I had enough to do a book, World War, you know, War in Paradise. Um, I'd like to think that uh, being a Florida native, being a history buff, being the son of a history historian, that I knew everything. I knew nothing. Uh, the amount of information I learned including stuff that happened right here in Boca. And a lot of it you guys probably don't even know, and you're going to learn tonight. So 
Let's start off and ask, what was the fourth largest city in Florida during World War II? Virginia Boca. Boca had 900 people during World War II. 900 <laughs> that could fit in this building. Wait a minute. The army camp. What army camp? The one that's on the uh, one of the uh, FAU. No. The army camp. I know. West Palm Camp Landing. <laughs> camp Landing. Probably never heard of it. It's right there. It's about halfway between Jacksonville and Gainesville. We used to pass it. Uh, when I was going to school at UF, when we'd go up to Jacksonville to visit our buddies, we'd go past this gigantic sprawling thing. Yeah, it's now a big National Guard uh, camp, but during the World War II, it was a mustering in and mustering out. So guys would come from all over the country, and they and they they they'd be based, at, you know, they'd be at a boot camp in North Louisiana or South Carolina, and they'd say, "Okay, you are going to be uh, stationed in Miami or Boca, or you know, they say, they say, where's Boca?" And uh, and they would all stop at Camp Landing. And then they would be separated out, and they would go to the different bases. So why was Florida so important to the history of World War II? Well, you've all heard about the U-boat wars. You'd be amazed how many people have not heard about the U-boat wars. Michael Gannon, a former Jesuit priest, University of Florida professor, I'm proud to say one of my mentors, wrote extensively about Florida history, but one of the things he got a wild hair to write about, wrote three books, was about the U-boat wars, and specifically the U-boat wars on the East Coast and Gulf of Mexico, which is where it was all happening. And these were U-boats. They were amazing machines. Man, they did their job. They were very efficient. What they would do is go up and down the coast and look for freighters. Now, why were they looking for freighters? They were looking for freighters because the US was now officially in the war. And you might recall that the day after Pearl Harbor, Germany declared war on us, and now we're at war with Germany. All these supplies were going to England to help fight the Germans on the mainland. Oil. Uh, you know, you can't get me to get on a freighter that's loaded with 10 million gallons of oil. Not going to do it. Uh, hemp. Not the stuff you smoke, but rope used, you know, for various things. Uh, Jeeps, paint, uh, wood, all this stuff. And they were making their rounds either over from like places like New Orleans or Houston, full of oil from the refineries there, or from the refineries in the lower Caribbean. There were refineries in places like Aruba and Carousel. And all these ships were coming up, and the U-boats were waiting for them. And what they did was... They would watch these ships, and the ships would be silhouetted in the lights from the hotels. Until finally the governor said to the hotel owners, you know, why don't you turn the lights off because it's making these ships sitting ducks. And, they, and even then it took them a while before they finally said okay. So, whoops. This is one of many ships sinking. What I talked about in my original article for the paper about the U-boat wars was that this was not something that was happening far away. If you lived in the Midwest, you maybe sent your sons to war. Maybe some of them didn't come back, but the war was far away. If you were on the East Coast, and especially Florida, we're going to explain that, the Florida, the, the, the war was right here. Why was the war right here? Well, these are the major commercial shipping routes, OK? Now keep an eye out. This is the one that's coming from the Gulf of Mexico, coming from the upper northern Gulf. I was doing the talk in Marco, and I was explaining to them th this route right here. This is the one that would come down from New Orleans and, and Mobile and Houston and places like that. See how far offshore it is? Because it's cutting the angle. So if you look at that map back there, you'll see that only a few ships were sunk there, and the ones that were sunk we're sunk way out, oh, this, my, my little red light doesn't work. Um, we're sunk way out in the middle of the ocean, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, not, right, not very close to shore. Keep, all, keep in mind also that there wasn't a huge amount of population in, in, uh, south of Fort Myers at the time. So there's that route, but there's this route. 
And you and I all know where that root is. It's where we're sitting. Why was that root such a killing field? Nope, 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 nope. You're getting ahead of me. The Gulf Stream. We all know about the Gulf Stream. We all know the way it curves. You ever wonder why uh, the Northeast never gets a Category 5 hurricane? This is it. The Gulf Stream curves right about here. And all that warm water goes to England, where it turns into freezing rain, which, you know, <laughs> we, if you're in England, right? But it never gets to New York or, you know, Boston or places like that. The, way, the, the water starts to cool off because the Gulf Stream's gone, and so that takes the juice out of the hurricane. Now, the Northeast has gotten some really bad storms. They were catastrophic, not because the storm was so incredible, but because when you've got a place like Manhattan, and it's you know, six inches above sea level, you've got subway tunnels, and all of a sudden you get a storm surge, it's really catastrophic. But this is the reason why, is because the Gulf Stream curves. But look where it is right next to Florida, right? Real close. How close is it? Well, I'm going to tell you how close it is. Anybody heard of the town of Gulf Stream right up the street? <laughs> it's called the town of Gulf Stream because it is the closest spot in North America to the Gulf Stream. So the freighters would ride the Gulf Stream because it was like getting a free tow, right? The Gulf Stream, seven, eight miles an hour, whatever it was, gave them, right? And they, they could just ride that Gulf Stream. The problem is that the U-boat commanders knew this. So how many ships got sunk? Well, 24 ships, just between February and May of 1950. 24 ships, 16 of them from Cape Canaveral to Boca Raton. <coughs> Look at that. Now, when these ships sunk, millions of dollars worth of stuff went down to the bottom. What else went down to the bottom? Sailors. 750 people. Yeah. 750 sailors, merchant marines, <coughs> civilians died, sunk by these U-boats, <coughs> ships sunk by these U-boats. So, Look up in Jupiter, you can see that there's a conglomeration there. That's where the Gulf Stream got real close. So here's the Republic, February of 1942. That was, that was the first one. And uh, one of the uh, torpedoes missed the Republic and hit the reef off the coast of Jupiter and knocked people out of their beds. So all of a sudden, the war was here. The uh, ship from the, Rep uh, the bell from the Republic is, uh, was salvaged and it's at the Jupiter Lighthouse Museum, if you ever get up to Jupiter. Now, the W.D. Anderson, it's the best picture I can get, you know, it sank, um, was hit just a few days later, February 22nd. And one of the people on the ship was this guy named Ralph Edward Terry. And I interviewed the guy in the 90s. He's gone now. He was <coughs> on the crew of the W.D. Anderson. He had pulled the grunt shift. Well, everybody was at mess. He had to work the stern. So he had his dinner early, he went out to the stern with another guy, and they're standing out there while everybody else is having a nice dinner, and two torpedoes hit the boat. <coughs> Ralph Terry jumped off the boat. Now you have to understand that jumping off the back of a freighter is not like jumping off the back of a pleasure boat. Okay, it was probably, I don't know, 30 feet. And by the way, it was February, and we all love Florida in February, but who goes in the ocean in February? Because it's, when he was finally rescued, he thought his legs were gone. He thought they'd been bitten off by sharks because they were so numb. He was in the water for about four hours. Everybody else on the ship died. Everybody else. Here he is in a hospital bed in, I believe, Stewart. Uh, when I interviewed him, he said, it was my first trip to Florida. I didn't like the experience. <laughs> oh, man. You, you ought to pay somebody for a line like that. I think, it's, I think it's at the front of the book. So over the next several months, they were picking off these ships left and right. And the reason was because there was nobody to protect the ships. The Americans really had not been ready, and Dr. Gannon talks about this, had not been ready for a U-boat war. They, <coughs> they loaned some ships to England. Uh, they had ships in dry dock. The Canadians were going to help. 
All their ships were in repair. And these poor merchant marine ships were just uh, sitting ducks. So now the German uh, <coughs> aims were, were multiple. Number one, obviously, they wanted to stop these supplies from getting to Europe. Number two, they wanted to scare the heck out of everybody in America, right? And number three, they wanted <coughs> to score an incredible propaganda blow. Look at this. The Americans, you want to join the war? Go ahead. They can't even save their freighters. So here's the Gulfland. This was the most tragic incident in the entire U-boat wars. By then, and it wasn't from a U-boat. By then, the federal government finally had started instituting convoys, and all of the U-boats' uh, attacks started to dwindle. But the ships still were sailing without lights, and two ships collided, no. the Gulfland and the Gulf Bell off the, port, uh, off the uh, coast of Jupiter. The Gulfland burned for six weeks. <coughs> when they finally were able to get to it, they found 12 sets of bones in the shower. The guys had tried to get to escape it as far as they got. The U-boat commanders were under strict orders. Don't ever fire on the mainland. I guess it was a line Hitler wouldn't cross. I didn't think there were any lines Hitler wouldn't cross. Uh, but for whatever reason, he did not want to fire on the US mainland. I guess he thought it would just start a whole new thing. But of course, we didn't know that, did we? You didn't know. People are like, am I going to go to bed tonight and a shell's going to... Clearly, the U-boats could drop a shell onto anyone's house because they were close enough. They didn't, but people didn't know that. So here's what they did. They were into full panic mode. They painted their headlights black because of the, the, as they were driving down the coast road. They uh, put cones on the street lights. So they would shine only straight down instead of out to sea. They had people patrolling the beaches. They had blackouts and drills. They had a blackout in downtown West Palm, where at a certain time, every electric light in the city of West Palm was turned off. Can you imagine? And they had all sorts of drills and stuff. They had people patrolling the beaches. <coughs> and of course, this was going on. I, 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 I deliberately used like women because, believe it or not, women were involved in the war effort. What a shock, yeah, yeah. But it was going on right here as well. So let's look at Florida the day before Pearl Harbor. If you ever get a chance, and I know it's far from here, to get up to Southern Martin County near Jonathan Dickinson State Park, there's the town of Hobe Sound. And at the corner of uh, Hobe Sound Road and US-1 Federal Highway is a place called Harry and the Natives. It's an old diner, curio shop, gift shop. They had the misfortune to open the morning of Sunday, December 7th, 1941. Yeah, but they survived. So let's look at what Florida looked like the day before. Population today, 22.3 million, ranked third nationally, right? What was the population in 1941? Two million. Equal to the current population of Broward County ranked 27th and the least populated southern state. And that became important when they started talking about the bases. I'm going to explain that to you. Military installations, 1940, eight in the entire state. How many by 1943? And they looked like this. And they look like this. Oh, I backed up too much. Now, where was Florida in the 30s? What was going on in Florida in the 30s? You all heard about it. It starts with a D. Yeah. And we know that Florida had been struck harder by the Depression than a lot of places because so much of Florida's economy we get at the time was based on tourism and the real estate boom. And the real estate boom was a house of cards. Everybody knew it. People started finally deciding, you know, that some guy in Ohio bought a house and he goes, well, bought a plot of land. And he goes, I want to finally come down to Florida and look at it and start building my house on it. And that's when he found that it was underwater. underwater, yeah. underwater, underwater. So you put those all together and the place and Florida crashed, crashed, crashed. They had the hurricanes and everything. 
Now they're deep, deep in the Depression. Well, what got them out of the Depression is the same thing that got everybody else out of the Depression, which was the war. Because <coughs> every time the federal government built one of those 172 bases, they hired a local guy. They hired a local contractor. They hired a local paver. They hired local people to put in the electric lines and the sewer lines. And that's all federal money coming into Florida. We all know the PA, right? How it poured all this, basically just poured all this money in, federal money to help get people out of the, out of the your jams. Well, this was, this was federal military money pouring in. And not just pouring in to build roads and fences, but they'd hire a local person to run the commissary. And they'd hire you know, her, her mom to make the pies. And every time a, a GI reached into his pocket for a quarter for a glass of orange juice, or a slice of pie, or a, or a glass of beer, or, or the or a jukebox, that's federal money coming to Florida. It added up, and it helped get Florida out of the Depression. But another interesting thing happened. I'm only going to tell you half of it. Here's the half. Everybody's standing around in Florida in February, and guess what? Yes, hold that thought. <laughs> so there was a base. Uh, this was, uh, I believe, uh, in uh, Morrison Field. I believe. I got to double check. OK, this is the, uh, what is it, Sue? This is the Fort Lauderdale Layer Station, which is now the airport. OK, there's someone in this picture. You got to figure out who it is. Youngest, at the time, the youngest Navy pilot ever. 20 years old. He was making bombing runs over Lake Okeechobee and off the coast of Boca. That's now all the airfield. Hold that thought. Here they are getting uh, these, all, a bunch of the, mil of the hospitals, like the Breakers and the Biltmore, were uh, borrowed by the federal government and turned into rehabilitation hospitals. For these guys, they were getting shot up in Europe. So they'd come back in here, they'd get, a, they'd get entertainment, uh, and maybe they just could have a, a nice glass of Coca-Cola with a couple of local pretty ladies. Here they are marching down Biscay Boulevard, <coughs> Biscay Boulevard in Miami. This is Camp Murphy. Anybody know what Camp Murphy is now? So you already know, shut up. What's Camp Murphy now? Jonathan Dick. It was a huge, huge Raider Institute. They had like 30,000 people training there. Anybody heard of Sidney Lumet, L-U-M-E-T, the director? 12 Angry Men and a couple other things? He was in charge of the company Skit Night <laughs> at Camp Murphy. And he said, hey, maybe I could make a living out of this. I keep forgetting to change this slide. I apologize. But, so forget the star on the uh, wing. In the years before America joined the war, they were trying to help out England. But they had to kind of pretend that they really weren't helping out England. There was a lot of winking. The government wasn't supposed to be helping out England because officially we weren't in the war. We couldn't take sides. <clears throat> so what they did was a guy named Riddle. Anybody heard of Embry Riddle flying schools? Yeah. He set up flying schools all over Florida. And in fact, they set they up flying schools all over the Sun Belt. And they were supposed to be private schools, but mysteriously, their bills got paid okay, by the federal government. Two of these were in Arcadia and Clewiston. Over the years, uh, 20, <coughs> 21 RAF pilots were killed in accidents. You shouldn't be surprised that there were a lot of accidents, right? Training accidents. So. If you are familiar with the history of the British Empire, at one time they used to claim that the sun never set on the British Empire. They had soldiers all over the world. And when a soldier died, often it wasn't practical to send the body back. And they would set up a local cemetery, a corner of the cemetery, which would become the British plot. And they would call it a little corner of England. So the people of the city of Arcadia gave <coughs> the British a corner of their city cemetery. And they called it a little corner of England. And that's where these 21 RAF pilots are buried. And every year on Memorial Day, busloads 
are British expatriates. You might know this. You might know that there are thousands and thousands of British expatriates in Florida. Go down to the red right down here on Federal <laughs> Highway on, when there's a big soccer game. There's a red newspaper called the Union Jack because there are so many British expatriates there. And every year on Memorial Day, hundreds of British come to this spot to honor these veterans, these RAF pilots who were killed. They call it a little corner of England. I've been to two of these ceremonies, one in 88 and I think one in 94. And when I went to the one in 88, you know, it hadn't been, it had only been 40 something years. And a guy was there, he'd flown in from England, he had timed his Florida vacation so he could go to this. He was the guy that, he said, oh yeah, that's Krosky, it was this, this grave right here on the left. He said, I had to send Krosky's wallet back to his family. So all of a sudden, it's really personal, isn't it? And here they are flying over Miami. Can you imagine? They're flying over Miami, American you know, pilots. And here they are on the beach in Miami. Now, interestingly, not all the people in this picture had US passports. There were hundreds of expatriate soldiers, exile armies, training in America in hopes that they could go back and take back their country. You might know that uh, one of the first groups to land on D-Day was a group of French soldiers who had been training in exile. Imagine how emotional it was for them on that day. But these guys, these were Chinese, Koreans, Poles, French, training in Florida in hopes that they could go back and take their country back. And then, of course, Oak Raton. You guys all know about Boca Raton's history. You know that when you go to the back of FAU and you look at these parking lots and you say, man, these parking lots, it almost looks like they took an old airport runway and turned it into a parking lot. <laughs> I had a buddy, our kids were in scouts together, and he was a traffic judge. And the cops would take him out to the overpass at Spanish River and I-95 because cars would make that, they'd get up to around Glades northbound and all of a sudden they take off. Try it sometimes. We just, drive in, just drive down the interstate and all of a sudden you'll notice everybody around you is going 80 miles an hour. <laughs> and he said it's a mental thing because what's to their right? An airport runway. And they just get this thing and it's a straightaway. You know, it curves at Glades. The reason it makes that little jog at Glades is that originally the Boca High football field was <coughs> west and they made them move it to the north side of the school so they could get the interstate through. And uh, so all these cars raced because they're right next to this airport. So half the, air, half, the, uh, half the Boca Raton Army airfield became the airport. The other half, of course, became FAU. Now you can see what Boca looked like in the early 1940s. My friend Sally Ling is going to come and speak on, which day? Coming up in March. And she's going to talk at length about the Boca Raton Army Airfield and also about some of the things that went on there after the war that were pretty sneaky. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the material which she got from me, which is fine with me. There was, and, and uh, Chief uh, Woods is going to talk about a horrific uh, plane accident that happened during the war at the Boca Raton Army Airfield. So there's tons of history about the Boca Airfield. I want to kind of cover all the different... Uh, aspects. <coughs> One of the important stories about the Boca Airfield is this guy. What's his name? George Morikami. Morikami was associated with the original Yamato colony. Make sure I don't make any, get anything wrong, Sue. And as you all know, the original Yamato colony uh, uh, collapsed, and they all went, most of them went back to Japan. Morikami had a sponsor that was supposed to pay his way back to Japan. If it didn't work out, the sponsor vanished. So he was stuck here. By the beginning, <coughs> by the early 40s, he had amassed very large tracts of land. The federal government came in and said, um, we are going to take your land and build an airport. Now, you wonder if his name was George Schmidt they might have treated him differently because George Schmidt had a name very similar to a country we were fighting. 
but it seems like nothing ever happened to George Schmidt, but things did happen to people named Murakami. So there were only a few hundred Japanese Americans in all of Florida. So we didn't have the horrific <coughs> things that they did on the West Coast, which I think we can all, anybody wanna, we can wanna have a debate that it was a good thing? Okay, good, I just wanna make sure. Uh, but what they did do was seize all their assets. Uh, they'd seize their bank accounts. They'd take away their guns, take away their cameras. Uh, they told Murakami he had property in Broward County. They said he couldn't cross the county line to, look in, to, to, to manage his property and his farms down there. They didn't trust him to cross the county line. After the war, he got a lot of his land back. He lost a lot of money. He was able to amass more land, and eventually, he gave all his land to yeah. Palm Beach County, where it's now, where people very, when your friends from up north say, what the heck is a Japanese garden doing in Palm Beach County, Florida? That's why. And he gave all this land because he said, America's been good to me. So, eternal optimist. <clears throat> so I mentioned the U-boat wars and why Florida was such a juicy target. And we mentioned about the Gulf Stream, but here's another reason. This is what a lot of Florida looked like back then, right? Not a lot, right? Pretty, pretty open. Plenty of places for the U-boats to come to, to fire on and do whatever they want. They brought in guys from Kansas on horseback to help patrol. Uh, this thing's not working. There we go. An interesting thing, Jupiter Inlet, okay? You know that the inlets are not natural. Boca Inlet, uh, Hillsborough Inlet, uh, Boynton, Jupiter Inlet, Palm Beach Inlet, or, or Lake Worth Inlet, you're going to call it. They're either, they're either not natural or the original inlet was very small and shallow and they dredge it to make it navigable. Well, that was the case with the Jupiter Inlet. And so they were always dredging it. If you've ever been up at the Jupiter Inlet, watch that water swirl. You don't want to be on a boat in it. Um, <coughs> so they had a horrific storm. And they get, got all ready to read, and it filled in the inlet. And they got all ready to redredge the inlet. And somebody said, wait a minute, let's leave the inlet. Because these guys on horseback can now cross the inlet and continue patrolling north into Martin County instead of having to make about a 30 mile detour inland and around. So they left the inlet alone. They also had something called the Civil Air Patrol. You guys might be familiar with this. Lantana was a major, major installation for the Civil Air Patrol. And they also had the Mosquito Flotilla. These guys were in pleasure boats who would go out looking for U-boats. And what's the question I always ask? What would you do if you found one? <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the high school, everybody's talking about the U-boat sinkings. And the teacher would go like this. Because she said, if the government doesn't if the government wants you to know, they're going to tell you. The government would usually wait three days before giving an official thing, and they had to deal with the newspapers not to report sinkings right away for national security, which when you think about it, it's pretty ridiculous because you could stand on the beach and watch the boat burning. So it wasn't a big secret. So everybody, <laughs> everyone out on the beach, right? Well, after a while, they closed the beaches. You couldn't go on the beach. If you lived on one of the barrier islands, like out here, or up on Palm Beach, and you had to cross a bridge to get to your house, you had to have an ID that proved you could go across uh, from the mainland. So <coughs> America was in a full war footing. People were training. People were sending their kids overseas. We had U-boats sinking freighters. We had all these bases coming, pouring in to Florida. Now, I mentioned to you about why we had so many bases. Yes, the warm weather. Yes, the fact that Florida was only very sparsely populated. But there's another thing, and what is it always? It was politics. Because Florida used to be <coughs> blue dog Democrat all the way. The joke was, until Claude Kirk, you couldn't, you couldn't, a Republican couldn't get elected dog catcher in Florida. <laughs> and there were congressmen and senators. There were two senators, Fletcher and Holland, who I think were senators for like 40 years each. So in, for 40 years, Florida had only two senators. 
And then all these congressmen kept getting reelected every two years, and they'd be there for 20, 30 years. A lot of them were up in the panhandle. Why? Because that's where the pop a lot of the population was. That, of course, changed as South Florida became bottom heavy. But all these guys up there <coughs> were all on, they all had seniority. They were all on these Ways and Means committees. And they said, well, we're going to build Eglin Air Force Base up in the panhandle of Florida. Oh, we want it in Missouri. No, it's going to Florida. So that's one of the reasons why we had so many bases here. And all these people are training here. And what were they training for? What were a lot of them training for? Yeah. I should tell you that uh, if you get a chance to go to Fort Pierce, the French underground had done a really good job of tipping the Allies about what was right at the French coast. And what the Germans had done, of course, they put all these pillboxes. And you saw Private Ryan. They took all the countries they defeated, and they shoved their, you know, they'd take a Pole and a Romanian, and they'd shove them in the pillbox and say, shoot at the Americans when they come ashore, or we'll shoot you. So they had all the pillboxes, but another thing happened. The Germans put these things in the water. They looked basically like a giant child's jack. You with me? Except they were razor sharp. And you remember that a lot of these boats were those flat bottom boats, Higgins boats out of New Orleans. And so they would come in, and the, what the Germans were hoping is that they would tear the bottom off the boat. Everybody would go into the drink, 10 feet of water, weighted down with 75 pounds of gear. Adios. But the French had tipped off the Allies. <coughs> <coughs> so the area right off Hutchinson Island in Fort Pierce was the perfect depth. So they created these things and put them in the water to train the pilots of these transport boats how to look for them and to also train guys to go into the water and look for them and destroy them, which is the beginning of the Navy SEALs. So if you get a chance, go up to Hutchinson Island and go to the UTD SEAL Museum. Because in the 50s, the Army Corps Engineers was <coughs> dredging and they found all these things in the water off Fort Pierce and they pulled them out and they're on the front lawn of the UTD SEAL Museum. They're, they're right on the front, front lawn of this. What are they made of? Metal, big metal rock, you know, big sharp metal things. Like coal troughs. They're, they're what? Coal troughs. They would trick the horses. Yeah. Battles. Yeah. So uh, you, if you get a chance, you should really get up there and check it out. So now Europe is invaded by Germany. So. People wanted to know what Germans thought of this big invasion. They weren't asking, thank you, they weren't asking German Americans, they were asking German Germans. What were German Germans doing in Florida? They were prisoners of war. Now, if you captured a German soldier and you wanted to send him to America and put him in a POW camp, and here's this North, pale skinned Northern European, right? Let's send him to a camp in Clewiston, Florida in the, uh, in the summer, right? Because they, didn't want not, they did not want these guys to enjoy themselves. This is actually at Blanding. <coughs> and that guy is the father of a guy named Harry Johnston, who later became a US congressman from West Palm. And Harry, his summer's up at Blanding dealing with the POWs. I interviewed him a few times. He's gone now. I interviewed him a few times about what it was like hanging out with these POWs. How many POWs were there? Well, I told you that Florida was a popular place for POW camps. How many were there in Florida? 22. 9,000 prisoners. Now, see number 17 and 18? We're going to talk about those, OK? So on June 6, 1944, the Miami News sent a guy named Milt Sosen, young reporter, to the south shore of Lake Okeechobee to the Camp Liberty Point in Clouston. And he's going to interview these guys. These guys are what? Yeah, what's see their name on their knee? So they here's how it worked. If you escaped and you were wearing your POW, and you got out of your POW garb and stole civilian clothes, you were no longer considered a soldier. You could be considered a spy, and you could be executed. 
So, and these guys didn't want to escape anyhow, because have you ever been out to Clewiston in the sugar fields? Can you imagine running into the middle of the sugar fields on foot in July? Oh, I'm going to escape, right? So he said to these guys, what do you think about the war? You know what they said? Oh, please. It's going to fail. Germany's going to win. Everything's great. Well, everything wasn't great. Well, one of the guys who didn't share their optimism was this guy. His name was Carl Behrens. And Carl Behrens was an 18-year-old kid from Germany who had never intended. He wasn't a, you know, wasn't a Nazi murderer, didn't run a concentration camp. He got drafted, and the next thing you know, he was at the front, and the next thing you know, he got, arrested, uh, got captured in Normandy. And he went to the prisoner of war camp in Clouston and promptly escaped. And for three days, it was terror. <coughs> <coughs> the whole state was in terror, because there's a POW, oh, he's going to murder all of us. They found him. He had hanged himself on the dike at Lake Okeechobee off a tree. So for the 50th anniversary of his escape, I found his brother back in Germany. Don't ask. And I, I got a German newspaper reporter to interview him. It was amazing. And here's what he said. He said that Carl came from what would now be called a dysfunctional family. His father committed suicide. He probably was bipolar, although they didn't know that at the time. And the Germans <coughs> had a caste system. If you were in the Luftwaffe or the Africa Corps, you were the elite. And it went down to the end guys like Carl, who were the cannon fodder that got sent to the front at the end. And they bullied these guys. And Carl was bullied by the elite Germans. And you put that all together, and he escaped, and he killed himself. So I wrote this story. And I remember the headline said, a lost, soil, a lost soul on enemy soil. This was the most powerful reaction I've ever gotten from a story I wrote, and it wasn't good. People said, how can you write a story that's sympathetic to this Nazi pig? How can you write a story that, why didn't you write about the Americans and the POW camps in Europe? I said, because you know, the camp was in Clewiston. We write about Florida. We don't write about Europe. And one guy, uh, one guy said, I'm looking at your last name. You're probably Jewish. Your parents must be so ashamed of you. Now, we can all agree that there was plenty of monsters in World War II. Plenty to go around. But we can also agree that there were probably a lot of Germans who weren't monsters. And the way war gets started is when you decide that everybody is a monster. This kid was not a monster. He was a poor kid who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I also understood <coughs> that, you know, this kind of stuff. I also understood that the people who were complaining could not be rational. Because I interviewed, you know, I got calls from POW, former POW, I got a call from Holocaust survivors. Their inability to be rational came from a place I couldn't imagine. So I had to let it go. So. I'm picking out this newspaper article, not because of secrecy shouting allied aspirations, but this little thing right here. <coughs> a bomber accidentally dropped bombs, a bomber from England dropped bombs on a farm in the panhandle and wiped out an entire family. And I interviewed this guy. His name was David Cuss. He had been 12 at the time. He's gone now. <coughs> Here's the family farm. You know what a cluster bomb is? It's a bomb that about halfway down opens up and about a dozen other bombs come out. And it killed everybody. And the military did not, uh, they admitted it at the beginning, but then they kind of covered it up. He never, it took him 30 years to finally get all the medical help he needed. And he died young. He had like 35 operations. It's just a tragic story about literally friendly fire. Now, there were a lot of rumors that flew around. Rumors, right? Rumors of war. We all know about rumors. A lady wrote to me and said that an entire U-boat crew surrendered in the downtown West Palm Beach Burdines. <laughs> <coughs> Another one said, you know, they, uh, Americans boarded U-boats and they found wholesome bread wrappers. Anybody, any old timers like me? It was a big bakery in Florida in the 40s. And they saw wholesome bread wrappers. Well, you know what that means. It means they came ashore, right? And they would see tickets to the, uh, to the West Palm Theater or the... The, the Florida theater. So they must have gone in and seen a movie. 
So, you know, come on. The reason I know that it's phony is because I interviewed the park ranger at Cape Hatteras, where there was also a lot of sinkings. He goes, yeah, up here it was the Ochre Coke Theater and Hatteras Bread. Because that's how urban legends are. They just change the names. Oh, the Miami Herald, OK. And um, Dr. Gannon said, well, OK, there's one more urban legend that I love. This guy wrote a book in a movie. There were magazines called Stag Magazines in the 50s. Now, these weren't girly magazines with, with naked pictures. There were, were articles about manly men doing manly things, like killing aborigines and you know, rescuing damsels and stuff. <laughs> <coughs> and some guy sold a story to this magazine without a whole lot of fact-checking. I don't think my newspaper would have gotten away with it. He said that there was a mansion in Palm Beach, and the old lady that lived in the mansion was a Nazi, <coughs> and her butler was a Nazi. And she had a ham radio in the basement and was signaling the subs at sea to sink the freighters. And, one day, and the FBI got wind of it, and they sent a bunch of FBI agents, and they had a shootout, and an FBI agent was killed, and the butler was killed. Oh, and by the way, she had a mini U-boat hidden in a cove behind her mansion along the intercoastal, you know, up there on the, on the intercoastal side of Palm Beach. And they came in and they had the firefight and they killed, were killed, they were arrested. And the Americans sent a plane over <laughs> that dropped a bomb and destroyed the mini U-boat. All of this apparently without anybody in downtown West Palm noticing. <laughs> so I actually interviewed the guy, he was already in his 90s, and he said, oh no, it happened, it happened, okay. <laughs> One time it did happen, right? in Jacksonville. Saboteurs landed. These were, all Amer these were all Germans who had lived at some point in America who could speak with a perfect accent, and they were all volunteered for the mission. Four were going to land near Ponte Vecchia Beach near Jacksonville, and four were going to land at the end of Long Island in New York. <coughs> and they were going to scatter through the country and commit acts of terrorism and scare the heck out of the United States. But the, the whole thing collapsed. Here's the eight guys. And here's why it collapsed. This guy, his name was George Dash. He came, he came ashore with everybody and he got as far as Washington and he said, this is a suicide mission and I'm gonna, just gonna end up in the electric chair, so I might as well surrender and take my chances, which he did. And so they caught everybody and six of the eight were executed and, uh, I'm going the wrong way. Six of the eight were executed. This guy was put in prison for life and then was uh, let out early and deported back to Germany. He insisted throughout the end of his life, he's trying to get back to America, that this thing would have worked if it hadn't been for him dropping a dime, which is an old expression. Well, in the 80s, a, a reporter in Atlanta went through the Freedom of Information Act and found all the FBI documents that proved that he really had, that the FBI had been clueless. But of course, they didn't want the world to know that this thing would have worked if this guy hadn't called them. He had already died at the time. So, Germany quits, the war's over, right? Everything's great, new hope for the world. And then they said, well, what if we need, we need to worry about the next one? You know, all those U-boat wars and everything. All those boats going from New Orleans to Norfolk have to go around this great big peninsula, which takes all this time and gasoline, and during that time, an enemy could sink them. So, I got an idea. The Cross State Florida, Cross Florida Barge Canal. Remember that? They actually started building it. If you ever go up to North Florida, there's actually where they just carved through and laid down concrete channels. The environmentalists loved it. Uh, Richard Nixon, of all people, put the kibosh to it. So now the war is over, everybody's happy, and now they gotta get all these guys back from Europe. Well. If you're familiar with Brazil and Africa, Senegal and Sao Paulo are the closest two spots of land in the Atlantic Ocean between, Euro, you know, between the, that part of the world and this part. And so they would fly these guys down to Senegal, over to Brazil, and up to Miami. Then they put them on a train and take them to Camp Landing. And on the way to Camp Landing, they had to stop in West Palm for water. And when they stopped for water, the agent at the West Palm CSX train station, his wife got an idea. She goes, I'm gonna, they only had 10 minutes. They couldn't get off the train. She said, I'm going to bring them cookies. She started bringing them cookies. I interviewed this lady. She was 90 years old, and she talked about how they did the cookies. Well, pretty soon, there were a whole bunch of people bringing cookies, thousands of people bringing cookies. 
And it was just a very moving way to honor these men who were finally on their way home. So the war ends, and all these people said, you know, honey, I was training in Florida during the war. It was February, and it was really nice. So 1940, 2 million people. 1950, 3 million people. 1970, I was 14 years old, 7 million people. Now, 23 million people. If you don't think that history is a row of dominoes, then you need to spend time here at the Historical Society. So, I've got some books available, and I thank you for your time, and again, thank the Humanities Council. I think I've got a few minutes for questions or comments. <laughs> questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. They had no ships. All the ships that they had were tied up in the Pacific, fighting the Japanese, or were now on their way to Africa to fight the Germans. They just didn't have any. And the ships that they did have were all under, you know, under repair. And then somebody would say, well, why don't, they just, why don't these freighters just stop operating? Yeah. Which, of course, is exactly, the U-boats would have been happy to just let the, if the freighters just stopped operating, they didn't have to wait the time and money to sink them. But there was nobody. And it, it took about two years to finally get the escorts going. If you ever saw the movie Greyhound with Tom Hanks, that new movie, that's what it's about. It's about escorts escorting merchant ships. Yes, sir. Um, all the Euro Germans were forced to go back to Europe. Uh, if any came back, I've never found anything on it. Um, I know there, were, there are stories of people in other parts of the country where they, they uh, came, or they, they were still there, and they just, for some reason, they didn't have to go back to Europe, and they just stayed there. But I haven't found any in Florida. <clears throat> I apologize for my cough. I've been fighting this for a week. One story about the uh, prisoners of war. There were camps in of prisoner of war camps in Camden, interior of the country, and they couldn't go anyplace because uh, where are they going to go? They don't have a uniform, they don't know the language, so they're there. And there are all kinds of stories about these German prisoners who go into a local town, socialize, etc., and American blacks weren't allowed in this town. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's a story that I always like to tell. And it's a very famous story. There was a black soldier who had been in Europe. Um, a lot of the black soldiers were not given combat positions, they were given support positions. They'd work in the motor pool or they'd work in the commissary or the mess. I interviewed this black World War II veteran and he says, yeah, except that the Germans didn't notice that we were black, they shot at us anyhow. <laughs> um, but there was, a <coughs> there was a black soldier who came back from Europe and he was on a Greyhound bus going out to, I think, Arizona. And the bus took a one-hour lunch break at a diner in Louisiana, I think. And he walks in, and the guy says, I, I can't serve you. You need to go over here to the window. I can feed you at the window. And while he's standing there, three German POWs walked in, escorted by two MPs, and sat down at the counter. And this black soldier wrote a letter to Harry, Harry Truman. And he said, Mr. President, please remind me what we fought for. What was that war about? And a lot of historians have said that that was one of the things that finally persuaded Harry Truman to uh, integrate the army, which was a very controversial thing at the time. But that, story, that letter from that guy supposedly was one of the things that finally did it for him. Yes, so you had a... Uh, and he decided to stay, uh, married a local gal, 
but we have a great interview with him, and he's saying, you know, everything was segregated at the base. So the <coughs> people for the black folk were separate barracks. He said, I don't get this. We're fighting the same war. We're fighting the same enemy, and yet we, we go through this silliness. I mean, really, we've done this to you ever since. Uh, he was in Europe three days ago, too, so he's very proud of that. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. You know, everything, you know, you read on all these people, and, and what they'll say is, they'll say, you know, my family came from Germany 25 years ago, but that's not the Germany that we're fighting now. And uh, my family came from Italy, but that's not the, we're fighting Italy. And uh, so the German Americans got it. And even the Japanese Americans got it. Uh, Murakami had left Japan when he was 10 years old. How could he possibly have any loyalty to Japan? And yet in the eyes of the government, he couldn't be trusted. Now, I mentioned earlier that it seemed odd that German Americans weren't rounded up in camps, but Japanese Americans were. So you know, a little bit of racism there, and uh, it's unfortunate. But yeah. Oh God! You know, there were there were there were probably tens of thousands of ethnic German soldiers. In fact, there's stories about guys whose grandparents had come from Germany, and they go they go to Germany and they can speak the language, and they used them as interpreters and stuff. But at no point did they ever say, "Oh, my loyalty is with Germany." No. So. Well, that's not German American guy. I believe you're right. Yes, Sarah, go ahead. I believe so. I and think, I, I, think, I think we did. I worked on a book on Palm Beach County during the war. And yeah, they were called up like right away. And then we had the Florida Guard. Yeah, you had something called the Florida Guard yeah, back they didn't then. Take that place. That's right. And then, of course, that, Blanding later became the, the headquarters for the Florida National Guard. Yeah, yeah. Last call, and who wants to give me the hook? One more call, question, or comment? <laughs> Anything I left out? Well, listen, thank you for, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> one, one slight correction. You mentioned that Germany declared war in the United States the day after Pearl Harbor. It was the 